Welcome to Caleb Can't Read. I'm Jordan Rabel. And I'm Caleb Terrence. And we are here to get this over with. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should take a break after this one for a little bit. Uh, I mean, this is a three-parter, and this is, this number, is number two. Three. This is number two? This, this is number two, yeah. Fucking God, stop making three-parters. I have to. Why? No, what do you mean? Oh, stop. You have I, to this do is literally, our second three-parter. You have to do none of this. Well, that's true also. Okay, so don't fucking... We're going to lose our sponsors, Caleb. That, fu- that phrase triggers me. Sponsor? No. What? No, have to. Mm. Okay? Because it only that's gets... what your bosses tell you every day. They're like, Caleb, only... we have to do this. And you're like, I don't want to. The only fucking time someone tells me something has to get done is when it doesn't. It, in uh, actuality. Fair enough. Yes, like, that is true. Because you know what? If it had to get fucking done, we wouldn't be having the conversation because I'd be fucking <laughs> doing it without worrying about it. Okay? <laughs> hey, so no, uh, this does not have to get done. This, this like, warning, by the way, is going to be coming too late because... So this is the second day that they're doing their first... Powell's warehouse sale and out of two days that they are doing it, mm-hmm. me and Nicole stood in line for four fucking hours. <laughs> yeah, that was not wise. Bro. It was not it and you know what? It was not worth it. And when they do it again next year, it's not worth it. Look, if you uh if you need if you have like two or three dollars in your wallet and you have like six hours to get a book to like stay out of prison, it's a wonderful it's it's wonderful. Go go do it. Uh, otherwise as man, that was not worth it. All the people that I know that we've got a large base in Portland too, like mm-hmm. whoever didn't go and were thinking about it. Good job, man. Actually, hang on. Oh, it's turned off. Oh no, wait. Hey, good. There we go. You did it. You don't need to <laughs> go to the fucking Powell's warehouse sale. Don't do it next year. Don't do it the year after that. Caleb can't read does not endorse the Powell's. We don't endorse. I don't endorse. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to go too deep into that. All right. <laughs> we got we got we got a whole fucking stack of papers to rip in here, folks. But yeah, <sighs> yeah. Do not go to the warehouse sale. Don't do it. I hope you somebody out there remembers that these <laughs> wise words next year. I don't year. think they're going to Don't fucking go. There's no way they're going to do it again, man, cuz I just saw it like it was bad. Like, like it, I keep seeing reels of it. It's on TikTok. Everybody's just like, "Fuck this shit." Like Yeah, no. The, <laughs> well, like, but they uh, here was my thing. They advertised um they said there was going to be food carts, beer, live music, and ice cream. Uh, when we got there, granted, there was like an hour and a half left in the day, but there was one food truck. The ice cream place closed early. Uh, the beer was Great Notion, which great beer, but I have a bone to pick with them because they they charge you $6 per taster at their tap house, and they don't tell you. Fuck off. Yeah, right? <laughs> so I don't drink Great Notion out of spite, and there was no musician. So <laughs> it was not a well made I mean, musician <laughs> that that could have been a blessing in disguise there. Could have been. Knowing Portland, it probably would have just been somebody with an accordion, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Take the accordion, fine, but somebody singing soulfully for like hours and hours can be really great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, let's get started, shall we? I suppose. All right. Uh, now, in our last episode, we talked about the early life of Jose Pretacio. Rizal Mercado, who had to drop his last name due to his brother Pasiano's run-in with the law. Now, what happened there is that there was this failed uprising in 1872 that was later called the Caviti Mutiny, where three friars named Gomez, Burgos, and Zamora were later executed for their suspected roles. People would later combine their names and make them martyrs for their cause under the name Gumberza. The thing is, Friar Burgos was actually a sympathizer with the Philippine revolutionaries, and one of his students was indeed Jose's brother, Pasiano. So to distance Jose from his brother, the Mercado family forced Jose to drop his last name and simply be known as Jose Rizal. Unfortunately for his parents, Jose looked up to his brother immensely and was showing signs of revolutionary rhetoric in school. So Pasiano, not wanting his brother to go down the same route, secretly sent Jose to Europe where he penny-pinched his way across the continent, still managing to earn his degree as an eye doctor in Spain. Remember something about crackers? Yeah. (laughs) Don't talk to me like that. Uh, While attending classes in Brussels, Paris. man, you're a honky if I ever saw one. (laughs) And all over Germany. (laughs) Well, at least I'm a straight honky, You look like the colonel. Yeah. That's not a a new insult for me, I know. (laughs) (laughs) Did you keep the facial hair, man? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Uh, Now, Rizal chose this career uh, as an eye doctor because he hoped to someday be able to fix his mother's failing eyesight. 
And while he traveled, Jose Rizal ran into other Filipinos with different perspectives of how it was to live under Spanish rule. And Jose had the great idea for each of them to collaborate on a novel. But when they saw more importance in getting laid than they did in writing a book, Jose elected to write the novel himself. Yeah, didn't they just... They, they wanted just, to write about Spanish women, yeah, which I not, don't blame them that's for. That's not getting <laughs> laid. That's being horny. Oh, they, I mean, they were, they were getting laid too. I, yeah. I looked into, so a lot of these dudes that he wanted to collaborate with were like a who's who of like Philippine history. They all have their own Wikipedia pages. When I looked into it, these were all, all these dudes were getting laid. <laughs> Max, right. Jose himself, actually, we'll get into it today. Uh, I mean, so you'd think that they'd be able to get their mind off it long enough to write something if they were, but... <sighs> I think we talked about it last time. They may have been like twenty six. Just kind so of it's f- like I get it. Just yeah. Kind of f- yeah, yeah. But I mean, there's you get the you know the post clarity, post yeah. clarity for a little bit. Just get have a little bit of productive time there. Honestly, I think it sounded very far fetched to a lot of them. Mm. Where there, where Jose Rizal is like, all right, guys, we're gonna collaborate on a novel, and it's gonna change fucking politics. And they're like, yeah, man, for sure, for sure. Ah, uh, yeah, I didn't do my assignment. <laughs> <laughs> like no They're like oh wow man that sounds very impressive just gonna write that down in here save that for what i'm gonna say i'm working on later like, <laughs> i'm gonna use this as a pickup line tell chicks i'm working on a novel oh me i'm working on uh this uh something that should change all politics yes yeah, so, uh... <laughs> well either way noli mi tangare released in 1886 with a mere 2,000 copies but was an immediate success Not fiscally, as the Spaniards had gotten a hold of the novel early enough to incite a ban, but Filipinos still managed to circulate the story in greater numbers. Because of this, the Spanish government in the Philippines were hearing about this book more and more, which would put the crosshairs on our very own Jose Rizal. Now the thing is, as the Spanish government would soon come to realize, Rizal wasn't even in the fucking Philippines at the time. Hell, he wasn't even in Spain. But that didn't mean the Spanish government didn't know exactly where he was at any given time. They had people watching him while he was in Germany. And about a month or two later, uh, Jose Rizal made his way back home to Manila with no real indication of how popular his book actually was. Within just a few days of his return, Jose Rizal was brought before Governor General Emilio Torero. Now, remember, this guy, the governor general, this is basically the president of the Philippines at this point. Now, granted, Torero hadn't actually read Noli Mi Tangare, but he heard about it, and he asked Rizal to explain himself. And I say that he didn't read it because, as it turns out, Torero was specifically referenced in the novel, saying there was this dipshit general out there slaughtering the Moros people, which was a tribe in the Philippines Torero had made a point to specifically massacre years ago. Now, although I couldn't find any records as to what was actually said or what happened during this little meeting, it seems like Rizal just downplayed what his book was actually about and made it seem like it was just a big misunderstanding. Remember, this dude was highly intelligent, and he played off being upper class very fucking well. So whatever happened, Rizal managed to just walk away. And it's possibly because of this that when Torero's term was up a year later, his position was not renewed. But either way, Jose Rizal was home again after five years away. And in 1887, the 25-year-old Jose Rizal was able to operate on his own mother's eyes, saving her sight just like he'd hoped to. I don't really want to look into uh, how eye operations were performed back then. (laughs) Like, do you think that they could actually, like... Sprinkle a little morphine in the eyes or something to like, I don't know. I don't know. Did you mean to make that pun? What? Never mind. Why don't you just what was reading? the pun? No, I love puns. What was it? Look into the eye operations. And although his family was happy to have him back, <laughs> the celebrations were short-lived. You see, even though Rizal had been released by Governor General Torero, his harassment from the government didn't stop. He wrote to his Austrian friend Ferdinand Blumentritt, the one who warned him this would happen, and he said, quote, My book made a lot of noise. Everywhere I am asked about it. They wanted to excommunicate me because of it. I am considered a German spy, an agent of Bismarck. They say I am a Protestant, a Freemason, which he was, a sorcerer, a damned soul, and evil. <laughs> I don't think anybody thinks you're a wizard, homie. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, that sounds mm, the sorcerer. <laughs> that sounds goofy, but like, 
I have seen witch doctors in the Philippines before. <laughs> They're still around. <laughs> like, <laughs> it is a real thing. <laughs> Look out for it's that a, Filipino wizard. He'll stab you. Hey, man, it goes on the resume. <laughs> it's a real occupation over there. <laughs> He continued, quote, It is whispered that I want to draw plans, that I have a foreign passport, and that I wander through the streets by night. The stalking from government watchdogs quickly put a toll on Jose Rizal, who felt the eyes creeping ever so slowly to not just him, but to his family, and even to his love interest, Leonor Rivera. Leonor Rivera was born April 11th, 1867 in Camaling, just six years Jose's junior. They were technically second cousins, as both their dads were first cousins. When they first met, Leonor was 14, which meant Jose was 20. But don't worry, they were not interested in each other at this point. The year after they met was when Jose left to study in Europe, and he left behind a fun little poem for Leonor as a goodbye present. Oh, so it's it's their grooming thing. Well, it, and honestly, you can see this poem. It, it really means nothing. Um, but I will say... In just a couple years' time, their letters would become romantic, which means she was probably 16. Yeah, he was doing kind of a grooming thing, even though there wasn't, like, a statutory law, I'm sure. There probably wasn't, honestly. Child marriage, I'm sure, happened all the time back then. He's kind of like, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Now, Leonore's mother didn't approve of their relationship, uh, you know, probably because they were cousins, but also... That boy isn't old enough. Yeah, because also, Jose was 22 years old at this point, so they started writing their letters in code one where they didn't use their real names. Uh, while writing... No- 22, then that one, so that would make her 16 yep. at that point. Mm-hmm. All right, man. Yeah. While writing Noli Mi Tangare, Rizal would base the character of Maria Clara on his cousin, Leonor Rivera, the main love interest. And Wait, by his cu- cousin? Yep. Well, second cousin, you know. Cousin's a cousin, man. I know. And especially in the Philippines, if there's somebody who's not your direct uncle or something, they're, they're a cousin. So, especially in the Philippines, yeah, no, they were cousins. There was no, like, once removed, twice removed, first, second, third cousin. They're cousins. Your They're just teena- cousins. Your teenage cousin. That is your teenage that cousin. you are currently grooming. It is weird to, yeah. Uh, <laughs> by the time Rizal was back in the Philippines, he and Leon- uh, Leonor had tried to get together, but both their fathers forbid it. Not because of the cousin thing. But because Rizal had... Not for any appropriate reason. Yeah, no. Well, (laughs) it was because Rizal had caused such a shitstorm within the country with that fucking book that everyone believed it would actually just put her in danger if he got close to her. I mean, that's... Uh, Yeah. yeah. Uh, By the next year, Rizal would stop getting letters from Leonor altogether, although he'd keep sending them. It turns out Leonor's mother had found her an English railway engineer named Henry Charles Kipping to court her, and although we don't have the birth records for this guy, his baptism was recorded in 1860, meaning he was probably a year older than Jose Rizal. Still inappropriate. I mean, you know. <laughs> no, go ahead, defend it. No, it even. Fe- <laughs> no, I was just gonna say I was gonna be like, eh, like maybe not to their standards, and it's like, man, that feels gross to say as well. It, yeah, I God. like. I mean, but this is exactly a thing he was talking about in the book, too. People just, like, were marrying up based on nationality. Mm-hmm. And it's like, hey, we got you this hard-drinking railway engineer. <laughs> and it's like, oh, no. No, 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 no. He's white and English. Oh, thank God. Oh, no, not a train <laughs> white guy. Oh, that's one of the worst types of oh, autism. No. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's starting so early. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and just to put a bookend on Leonor Rivera's story, because... She is kind of important to his story as well. She would actually die just a handful of years later in 1893 at the age of 26, possibly from a complication during childbirth. Although she said the railway engineer was her one true love, she was she asked to be buried with a silver box which contained the burned remains of Jose Rizal's letters. Take that as you will, I guess. And I mean, that's pretty serious. Yeah. And one true love. Uh, do you want to be buried with any of like my possessions? N- no, no, just just this box of ashes. Let me go. Just that box of ashes, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that for? Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. <laughs> now I will say, uh, not quite like some authors we've covered in the past, where they want their letters burned because they were super horny. Uh, Leonor was forced to burn her letters because at a certain point in our story, anyone proving to have any correspondence with Jose Rizal will be persecuted for conspiracy. (laughs) Well, sometime before Leonor Rivera's death, about two years after she was forced to cut contact with Jose, 
Rizal decided to leave the Philippines once again. He believed the harassment he faced was starting to affect his family, so he went into a self-imposed exile in 1890, heading for Paris. Now, he wasn't in Paris long before making his way to Brussels for a much longer stay, but while he was in Paris, he roomed with a couple sisters in their mid-40s named the Jacobis and their 17-year-old niece. <clears throat> now, he did fuck one of them. He hinted that much in his diaries, I believe. Um, but my personal guess is the niece, because when he left for Brussels, he left a box of chocolates behind, and the kids sent him a letter which said, quote, This thing about teenagers, man, it's just easy pickings because their brains aren't developed. <laughs> The fuck? Oh, man. he's so romantic. A box of chocolates. Yeah, no, that that would uh, that make my blood pressure get up. I don't. I wouldn't want anyone to give me a box of chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Her letter. Her letter read, "Quote: After your departure, I did not take the chocolate. The box is still intact as on the day of your parting. I don't want chocolate. I never wanted the chocolate. What the fuck? <laughs> don't delay too. It's the wrong color toy. Yeah." <laughs> Don't delay too long writing us because I wear out the soles of my shoes for running to the mailbox to see if there is a letter from you. There will never be any home in which you are so loved as the, in that in Brussels. So, you little bad boy, hurry up and come back. Oh. That's what makes me think. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty. <laughs> that one made me, I was like, I think it was the niece. <laughs> yeah, that's just a feeling. I, you know, I don't think anybody's. I don't think anybody's called me a bad boy that hasn't a little bad boy been sleeping with me. Like, I mean, you are a little, so it's like <laughs> <laughs> it goes without saying. It's like when you call and you're like, "Yeah, man, I'll be there shortly." Yeah, I know. Fuck off! Fuck off! <laughs> oh. fuck off. Hey, hey, five eight is the international average for a man's height. Okay, so I'm this gonna is get normal. you. I'm gonna get you those Ron DeSantis shoes that have the heels in them. <laughs> <laughs> that's not why my boots have heels. It's for logging. It's, it's because I like cross. It's so your ankle doesn't get rolled if the log comes over it and it gives you better traction on an incline. It's not because I'm self conscious <laughs> about my height. <laughs> oh, 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 you're not self conscious, but <laughs> sorry, payback. Uh, now, uh, <laughs> now, while Rizal was in Brussels, he mostly spent his time partying. Though he did take time to network with debutantes in the upper echelons of society, trying to convince them that uh, Philippine representation was something worth fighting for. And part of the reason we have such great documentation of where, Jose, uh, where Rizal went during this time is because for every party he attended, every social gathering he went to, everyone would go home and write about him later that night. People even kept the fucking napkins he drew on. Because he was a great artist, too. Remember, he had a lot of different talents, so he could talk with anybody. Uh, you remember that little laugh Nick Offerman did when he ate the strawberry on The Last of Us? Yes. <laughs> Everyone giggled like that when they met Jose Rizal. <laughs> and already, Rizal was working on his second novel, a sequel to No Limitangre called El Filibusterismo, which, again, has been called things like the subversion, or the reign of greed, but which is literally translated as the filibuster. So I'm just going to continue calling it by its original name. Um, I do want to give a small recap, though, of what happened in Noli Mitangre. So basically, Crisostomo Ibarra comes back home. He's like a proxy for Jose Rizal himself, falls in love with Maria Clara. Uh, he gets caught up into the politics of the world, and basically he and this dude named Elias uh, try changing the community and when it doesn't work out uh they get chased off by civil guards maria clara hears that one of them got killed and so she wants to go to a convent and not marry anybody where she then just becomes repeatedly abused by one of the priests and at the end of the book there's a boy who finds somebody either chrysostomo or elias and he ends up building a funeral pyre for his mother sets it alight, and one of the dudes jumps in. Uh, so we are pretty sure that one dude was killed already, and the other one just burned himself alive, you know. So that's how that book ended. Okay, okay, okay. Now, the book takes place 13 years after the events of No Limitangre. Our main character from the first novel, Ibarra, it turns out, has survived. It's revealed that at the end of the last book, when the unnamed man helped the boy make a funeral pyre for his mother and then joined in, that man was Elias. 
He himself escaped capture from the Spaniards, and the report of the civil guards having killed either him or Ibarra was greatly exaggerated, which means there was never a reason for Maria Clara to have joined the convent. When the boy, named Basilio, walked back to the fire to bury the remains, he finds Ibarra standing there. Ibarra decides to take Basilio under his wing as a revolutionary. As the years go by, Basilio becomes an aspiring doctor, while Ibarra travels from city to city under the name Simon, a wealthy jeweler who looks for connections. He's likened to, quote, a Philippine Ulysses that began to wander from town to town, from province to province, from island to island. You see, Ibarra has been the, uh, or sorry, Ibarra has seen the error of his peace-loving ways from the last book and is looking to start a revolution. However, Basilio trails behind him every step of the way, reminding him that revolution will only lead to violence and harsher laws. Like, yes, that is, that, that is, that's, the point. <laughs> that's, yes. that's step one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, that's kind of all that the book is about, all these different aspects of war Ibarra wants to enact while Basilio tells him not to. And the whole point of the book is to get it across to pro-revolutionary Filipinos that war will not work. Remember, Jose Rizal himself, very against revolution. He just wants representation. That's all he's looking for. I would like us to also have the opportunity to be pieces of shit. You know, if you rule yourself, <laughs> though, you have full representation. Like <laughs> Anyway, about partway through the book, Ibarra finds that Maria Clara is still alive and being kept at the convent. So, he stages a rescue, but on the night of his plan, he finds that Maria Clara's died that very same day, just over nothing. A broken heart, perhaps, who knows. Mm -hmm. Similarly, Basilio learns that his adoptive father has died of an overdose, his girlfriend committed suicide, and he has no money to continue school, all in the same day. So, without anything to live for, Basilio joins Ibarra's fight, and together they decide the best way to start a revolution is to bomb a wedding. Jesus, okay. It is kind of realistic. <laughs> it never happens, but by the end of the book, Ibarra dies of an illness, and he says that none of his plans worked out because it was not God's will that change be made by violent means. The end. Granted, I am greatly underrepresenting El Filibusterismo because um, I didn't like it. <laughs> it's it's a shorter book. Than- it doesn't seem as... Um- it wasn't as impactful. There wasn't a good story, it felt like, honestly. It's, yeah. Doesn't seem as involved. Basically. I mean, I really feel like Noli Me Tangre had, like, a great aspect of different perspectives of life. Like, if, if Rizal was only doing things from his own point of view, he definitely took his friend's ideas of, like, how they grew up. Like, he knew how they how they lived. And he put those people as characters in his book. This one... It felt like it should have been a manifesto, but just he turned it into a novel. It's a shorter book than Noli Me Tangere by like a hundred pages, but it is a hundred times more convoluted. Ugh. But still, Rizal's message is clear. Violent revolutions do not work. The problem is, at least to me, if you don't make it to the very final chapter where Ibarra recants his evil ways then it sounds like the hero of the story is saying violence is the answer the entire time. And that's the thing. It's been almost five years since the Noli came out, and people were still buzzing about it. So there were probably a lot of people that got the wrong message from this one. Like, Noli Mitangre is taught in Philippine high schools, which is great, because it's a really good story and shows people what they were up against. But El Filibusterismo is typically taught in college because it allows you to break down all these different aspects as to why social reform was the way to go. It is much more complex. Now, much like his first book, Rizal used loans from friends to get El Fili published. And just like last time, his friend Ferdinand Blumentritt had read the novel beforehand to tell him his thoughts. And once again, Ferdinand told him the book would get him in trouble. In fact, he said that this would probably be the thing that gets him killed. Rizal even dedicated the book to Gumberza, those three friars that were executed, and were very much mascots of the revolutionaries, like the Spaniards knew that. But Ferdinand still believed in the overall message. He wrote the preface to the book and was even working on translating Noli Mitangre to German. Eventually, El Filibusterismo was published in the town of Ghent in Belgium in 1891. And just like Noli Mitangre, El Filibusterismo was instantly banned in the Philippines, even quicker this time too. 
But Rizal had already left the Philippines, so he figured there was no reason for holding back. And because of this, his second novel attacked more than just the Spanish government and the church. This time, Rizal went after the upper-class Filipinos as well, who had typically worked their way to positions of power by selling out their fellow countrymen. To the wealthy Filipinos, if you were rich enough, you were just promoted to Spaniard. They thought they could just Uncle Ruckus their way to the top and be born <laughs> white in heaven. And meanwhile, Rizal's name was so famous amongst Filipinos. God, you can't. What? Yeah, there's no responding to that reference. <laughs> that's appropriate. Like, there's no. No, come on, quote the show. There's no quote. No. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile, Rizal's name was so famous amongst Filipinos that his whole family decided to drop their traditional last name just to share his. Quote, all my family now carry the name Rizal instead of Mercado because the name Rizal means persecution. Good. I too want to join them and be worthy of this family name. Before, Jose hated his last name because it meant that he was different than his family. But now, he was willing to lead the way for social revolution in the Philippines. But just like his friend Ferdinand Blumentritt warned him, sticking out his neck even further was putting himself in danger. Now, while Rizal was living in Belgium, and with his latest novel being distributed secretly through the Philippines, it's hard to say if he knew just how much he was being talked about at home. If you rely on the letters he was getting from his family, it seems like there was an understatement to just how popular he was. Yeah, I think, like, he's smart for not stirring shit while he is in the Philippines. Yeah, you know but what I mean? he keeps going back. But he has no... <laughs> Yeah, but, like, while he's gone, he has no idea how much shit he's actually fucking mm -hmm. stirring. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, mm -hmm. However, he was friends with a lot of Filipinos in Europe who undoubtedly were getting letters from their own families. Like, holy shit, you're friends with the Jose Rizal? Throughout his stay in Europe, with Rizal figuring he'd be safe so long as he never stepped foot in Spain or the Philippines again, he just started bashing the Spanish government and the Catholic Church more than he had before. Before he'd published El Fili, Rizal had written an essay called The Philippines a Century Hence, which basically warned Spain that the people were getting damn close to a revolution if they were insistent on not giving them representation. And because a lot of the Filipinos that Rizal knew in Europe were part of the propaganda movement, all his articles were making their way to the Philippines whether the government wanted them to or not. Even in Europe, his essays were making the rounds in an underground Spanish newspaper called De Solidarity, which was mostly comprised of Filipino exiles. And I will say, as much as I do like Jose Rizal, he did get a little big for his britches at this point. He demanded the Solidarity, the newspaper, be handed over to him, like for him to run it, just because he was so popular. It actually led to a vote to see if he or the guy who was already running it Why don't should... you go calm down and eat some crackers? <laughs> like... <laughs> no, it costs too much. <laughs> Fuck. It actually led, like, he, he caused so much of, like, a scene, though, that they actually held a vote if it should be him or the guy who was already running things to run it. And Rizal lost in a fucking landslide. Like, yeah, dude, you don't know how to... You're not a businessman. You're a writer. Well, I, uh, yeah, no, go go sit down. You're fine. <laughs> Now, of course, the Spanish government wanted to stop the bootleg copies of his books, but they couldn't. And they wanted Rizal stopped, but they didn't know where he was. Basically, they knew he was somewhere within the entire continent of Europe, but they weren't sure where. They nailed it down to somewhere in this continent. Uh, yeah. I, well, it's better than, I don't know. <laughs> Actually, it's not good at all. That sucks. <laughs> It's a lot of fucking people on <laughs> a continent, bud. <laughs> it's a lot easier once um, once you get microchipped by taking the vaccine, because now they just know where you're at, al right. always, you know. And it's too bad that they didn't have that back then. The shit was wild, man, because it's just like your phone, dumbass. Oh, the, the conspiracy yeah. theories about that? It's, it's like, so it's fucking already, dumb. They already got it. You didn't... I talked like... with a dude who was, like, ex-military, and he was like, dude, they couldn't even pinpoint our locations. We shot so many of our own guys. They didn't... <laughs> we didn't know... <laughs> If they can't keep track of us, why the fuck would they want to keep track of you? <laughs> you know how many people's kids I shot? <laughs> you get a medal eventually. So the next best thing they figured they could do was defile Rizal's good name. Now, there's no way to know if anyone actually told this journalist to do this, 
or if it was just a coincidence. But what this guy did was praised by the Spanish government either way. You see, Wenceslao Retana worked for a Spanish newspaper called La Epoca, and he wrote an article saying Rizal's infamy was affecting his family, and it's almost as if Rizal didn't care. He said his family had been kicked out of their home in Colomba for unpaid rent, and that his mother was under arrest for poisoning a cousin. I don't, that doesn't sound, I mean, explain. Well, here's the thing. Both of those things were true. (laughs) But the truth had been twisted in both of these cases. As far as his family getting evicted goes, yeah, the local friars from the church were actually the landlords of Columba, where his parents lived. And they didn't like the way Rizal's books were calling them a bunch of greedy, hypocritical rapists. So in response, they did something really fucking greedy. They raised the rent, like astronomically high. And not just to Rizal's family, though, to the entire area. Raised it so high that it forced at least hundreds of people out of their homes. And you had just 12 days to move out once you were evicted. If you didn't, the civil guard would come with guns and burn your fucking house down. <laughs> I feel like that's how people should get evicted now, actually. That'd be dope. Just that's <laughs> the most, burn down the house every time. <laughs> that's the most toddler shit. <laughs> right? Just like streaking, <laughs> freaking it. Mine! Ah! No, well, dude, I'm gonna I'm gonna burn it so you can't have it, then. It's just so dicky. Nobody's like, paying for it. I don't need it. I'm not living in it. Yeah, landlords. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They were like this always and uh, around the world. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, but there's a reason a lot of them got killed a little while ago. So just landlords? just put it out there. Yeah, yeah. What happened? You don't what? know about? Never mind. Go on. Oh, okay. We're we're gonna talk about this later. This is not no, recent very... history. Uh, oh, okay. <clears throat> but I hear you asking. What did the church do with all that property anyway? Well, Caleb, they sold the homes to other friars for super cheap so they could practically have their own city. It was a mini Vatican in the Philippines, if you will. <laughs> wow. And that sound like so much fun in some place you would not want to go. This is also like really <laughs> dumb. Like if somebody's stirring up shit with all the people to just like double down on being a fucking asshole. I, right. Like, it's it's like, does like, that not sound more dangerous to just like, like, all right, well, you think I'm shitty? Well, now I'm going to be 10 times shittier. Okay, <laughs> you know it's not hard to find a like a, a sword here, right? And also, or, the like, guys. <laughs> or just a sharp stick, really. Like I could kill you with a lot of things. I could do it with my hands <laughs> <laughs> right now. <laughs> so people are really stupid. scary, actually. <laughs> <laughs> now, as far as the rumor that Jose's mom, Teodora, was arrested for poisoning a cousin, that also happened, but that didn't have anything to do with Jose's fame, as that incident happened when he was only ten years old. As the story goes, Teodora had a half-brother named Alberto, and Alberto wanted to divorce his wife because he suspected her of cheating. Teodora asked Alberto what evidence there was that she was cheating, but he said he didn't have any. So, she told him to stop being a superstitious asshole and chill the fuck out. And you know what? It worked! Alberto stopped treating his wife shitty, and it saved their marriage. This brought Alberto and Teodora closer together, and because of that, Alberto started hanging out at the Rizal household in Colomba more and more. However, Alberto's wife was also a suspicious asshole. She saw that her husband was visiting Teodora more and more and thought they were working on a plot to kill her. (laughs) It's quite a jump. Yeah, well... (laughs) (laughs) Or thought, like, oh, is she worried about infidelity or something? Are you fucking your own sister? No, it's... You're going to try and fucking, you fucking what? <laughs> like you find your girlfriend going through your fucking phone and she's trying to find out if you're fucking going to murder her. And you're just like, oh, okay, shit. Now this is a very advanced problem. I was not prepared for. <laughs> like, yeah, no, that's actually a much more alarming. It's like, like, oh shit. Give me your phone. <laughs> okay, fine. You're going to be one of those girls. You're trying to kill me. Aren't you? I want oh. my phone back now. <laughs> I want my phone back. I'm going to get in my car. <laughs> like, I need you to, uh, you, uh, you know what, baby? You call me an Uber. All right. And I, I'm going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Take the apartment. Take it. I don't care. (laughs) So Alberto's wife, she gets a cop to investigate. In a stroke of luck, turns out this specific cop had a grudge against Teodora. In the past, he'd wanted free food from her shop, but she said no. That was all it took for this guy to put both Alberto and Teodora under arrest and throw them in jail. (laughs) Now, Teodora figured she could just clear this all up with the judge, right? Well, as it turned out, The judge was also someone who wanted free food from Teodora's shop and to whom she also said no. 
So the judge sentences Teodora to prison in the town of Santa Cruz, which is on the other side of the bay from where they're at, a distance of about 26 miles. Usually, you would take a boat to, like, cut across to the prison, but the judge says, no, you're hoofing it. So the guard, with guards watching her, Teodora is forced to walk all the way to the Santa Cruz prison as a form of humiliation, even if it takes her more than a day to get there. Now, just through Google Maps alone, it looks like the journey would take like nine or ten hours to walk there with no breaks. So eventually, it comes to night, where the guards decide they're going to take a break in a nearby town. Turns out, though, there's this huge festival going on, and the local bigwigs of the area know Teodora for her thriving business. Remember, her family farm was bustling because of her. She was running a very successful business for the area. So before the guards can even say anything, one of these big shots tells Teodora to come party with them. And so she does. She goes inside their house, and the cops are left at the front door of this huge mansion with a bodyguard at the front not letting them inside. (laughs) Well, one of the cops runs to tell the judge what's happening, who comes down there himself to get Teodora back. Did he walk? Uh, He probably took a rickshaw. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, he walked nine hours just, fuck! I should have taken a boat. God. Damn it. <laughs> and he argues with the bodyguard at the front entrance who's like, I don't care if you're a judge. I don't work for you. You can't tell me shit. And the judge not only breaks his cane over this guy's head, but he drags the owner of the house into the street and beats the fucking shit out of him, too. Just went on judge, <laughs> fucking judge dread on him, dude. Like, <laughs> judge dread, oh, no. I am the law. <laughs> <laughs> so in the end, Teodora does go to prison, where she tells the whole story with witnesses to her lawyers who are able to move her case up the Supreme Court. The court says that it's obvious the judge was working on a vendetta, so they order her to be released. But before she can go, the judge says that her staying at the house during the festival was technically contempt of court, which it was. Like She was, she was on an order to go to prison, whether or not it was right for her to go in the first place. And uh, so a new trial begins because of this. And the Supreme Court says, you know what? You're right. Contempt of court. Anyway, time served. You're free to go. But then, before she can even leave the jail, a new lawsuit reaches them, one from Teodora's brother, Alberto, saying she borrowed money and never repaid him. And because of this, Teodora was thrown in jail yet again. Now, as it turns out, this lawsuit was completely made up by none other than Alberto's lawyer, the one presenting the lawsuit, because he was hired to take care of the case regarding Alberto poisoning his wife, and since that never went anywhere once Teodora became a target, he never got paid. So he was just pissed off about it, and he wanted revenge on somebody. Alberto didn't even know it happened. (laughs) Do they not, like... Double-check anything? (laughs) Did they not have, like, criminal charges for people who, like, did shit like this? I mean, I think it's just known to history like, nowadays, but, like, back then, they just, they weren't sure what No, I mean, happened, if they're probably. dismissing something because it's, like a, ven- like, a clear, like, vendetta issue, and it's, like, did the guy get penalized? They were, like, hey, well, clearly, also, like, you're just what, pissed. Like, what so- fucking proof do you have that she never paid anything? That there was, like, a bill? Right. Like, I don't know. Uh, honestly, those judges could have been paid off. I mean, I, I, who knows? Whatever. Fucking cops don't get penalized for killing people now, so, you know. Judges are, um... Still shady in the Philippines today, too. So, like, you know. <laughs> shady Philippines. There's no shade in the Philippines. It's like 110 <laughs> degrees in the fucking shadows. It's <laughs> it hurts you, dude. It, like, permanently damaged you and turned you red. Like <laughs> This is because I stood for four hours <laughs> waiting for fucking Powell's warehouse. I know. I was thinking about that, like, because I saw that you posted. Um... That you were, like, stuck in the fucking line. I was really concerned about you, man. I was, too. I actually, uh, I got an umbrella from it's the It's got to be, like, the most physical activity you've had in... Standing. <laughs> no, I mean, the most physical physical activity you've had in fucking Christ, dude. I mean, your entire life. It's been a while. It's been a while. That was a workout. My knees hurt more just from standing. It was, oh. it was tough. I had to take smoke breaks. I mean, they're pretty sturdy hard. from, you know, holding your whole... That's why my knees hurt so bad. That's what I mean, man. There's a limit, (laughs) dude. The cycle's to failure. Like this. No, we got an umbrella from the car. We were shaded. Um, 
there was nobody else that had like umbrellas, like, but they were like trying their best to like Is it shield that's themselves. A- they they were doing it with like chairs and shit that they found. <laughs> also, we cut through this like homeless dude's uh, tent too. Like the l- line went past it. I don't know if he was in there or not, but if he was, he was sh- he was shaded. I would have given him five bucks to like hang out for it's a bit. Most Portland shit I've heard. <laughs> Yeah, but I will say there was a uh, there was a homeless dude that was like selling bottles of water to people in line, and that he turned a profit. I'm sure it was a bunch of like probably free water he got from like, a, um, what would you call it? Like a, a homeless shelter or something like that. Like he got a bunch of bottles of water, and he was on one of those uh, Nike bikes, and he was like, he was mm-hmm. like two dollars each. And people were buying them up. I mean, See, that's the American that was, way, dude. That was smart. That's I mean, how I'm you honest, get some fat later. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, that guy fucking. Hey, man, if you want to grind your teeth, you got to grind on the streets. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. uh, well, anyway, it was two and a half years later after Theodora, like, got sentenced to prison. It was two and a half years later that the governor general of the Philippines was at some festival where he met this very charming little girl. He was so enamored with, with her that he asked her what she wanted as a present. Some flowers, a nice new hat. And she was straight up like, I want my mom back. And he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it turns out it was Teodora's youngest kid. Uh, Rizal's, uh, Jose Rizal's youngest uh, sibling, Soledad. So the governor general finds out about Teodora's case, had a new trial, and she was immediately released two and a half years after all of this shit began. So going back to this newspaper article in La Epoca, Jose Rizal hears this guy saying his mom was a criminal and his family got evicted for unpaid rent, right? So Jose has a friend show up to this journalist's house and tell him to pick a time and place for the duel. Remember, Rizal liked giving off the impression that he was upper class, and to him, that meant one of his many skills was in sharpshooting. But he wasn't a very good swordsman yet, so he hoped this guy would choose guns because that was the rule. You know, if if one person requests the duel, the other person gets to pick the weapon. But the journalist, Wenceslao Ratana, got... I pick rocks. <laughs> <laughs> what? Rocks. <laughs> he got so fucking spooked by the request that he later issued a public apology in the newspaper and became the first person to write a biography on Jose Rizal. So if the Spanish government did in fact have something to do with him writing that article, it ended up backfiring tremendously. Soon, Rizal had moved a little closer to home, Hong Kong to be exact, where he opened up a practice as an ophthalmologist. Here we go again. As an eye doctor. Although he was only there from December of 1891 to June of 1892, a period of about six months, Rizal wrote about several women he was possibly having relationships with. I think most of them patients, which is actually a little concerning. In one letter we have from Maximo, eh, I mean, eh, I look, man, I, what we've been <laughs> hearing, can we just be happy if they're adults? <laughs> like, you feel me, man? Like, okay, yeah, no, it's not be that critical. It's like. You know. I, I I mean I think it's it's uh I do think it is shady if you start dating a patient honestly I think it is a little weird I mean I'm if sure. you're like a therapist or something yeah but oh like, yeah 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 like, I don't true. know just An like eye a doctor I guess like a doctor or something yeah I mean a surgeon it would be a little inappropriate if you were having that kind of conversation but like I I, I think I he is kinda... an eye surgeon oh yeah yeah but like I, I don't fucking know man she, like he, he's fucking with their eyes so he looks like you're like a, much taller and like stronger. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just going to keep that blurry. (laughs) (laughs) In one letter we have from Maximo Viola, the man who financed Noli Mitangre's publication, he said that his friend Jose had fallen in love with a, quote, Lady of the Camellias, which was the title of a novel by Alexander Dumas about a guy falling in love with a prostitute. Now, Rizal never had any documented relationships in the Philippines, but here in Hong Kong, he was letting his freak flag fly. In fact, because he was super into documenting his own life, we know exactly who nine of these women actually are, including a British aristocrat and the last descendant of a noble Japanese family. I mean, do we know? Do we know? We know. You know what I mean? No, we know. We know. No, I mean... You, you they were it. writing about it, too. Okay. All, right, all, right, all right, all right, all right. And this, that was nine women that we have identified. That was in all in six months. 
That's not bad. He was really putting the Riz in Rizal, you know what I'm saying? Shut the fuck up. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. It's what the kids say. We're too old, man. We're too old for that shit here that Caleb can't read. Okay. So when Rizal was skibbity toileting his way down the street, no. <laughs> God damn it. No, did, did Rizal fuck around? Absolutely. It's one of It's actually one of the first things people bring up about him. But I would like to clarify that there is one person he did not fuck and that was Hitler's mom. So I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, let's go. Let's I mean, go. hey, have you? I mean, you know. <laughs> Just keep reading, man. I want to see. Come on, let's go. So being as famous of a figure as Rizal is, there will inevitably be conspiracies that surround him. One of which says that Hitler's mom and Jose Rizal were in Vienna at the same time. So it's possible that Rizal is Hitler's dad. But no, that's absolutely stupid. And I bring this up because out of all the conspiracy theories there are about Jose Rizal, most of them are about what kids he possibly fathered. That Japanese noblewoman, she had a kid that ended up being close friends with Emperor Hirohito during World War II. And of course, there are rumors that Rizal is the father. He isn't, though. We can actually verify that through uh, birth records. But the conspiracy theories on this guy get so fucking dumb. Uh, you know what was going on in England while Rizal was supposedly visiting? Mm. Uh, just a little something called the uh, Jack the Ripper murders. Jack the Ripper, J.R., Jose Rizal, J.R. Shut the f- no. I'm not making this up. That's a real conspiracy theory. That's fucking fantastic. <laughs> That's fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> because if you know anything about the Jack the Ripper case, you know the killings were done with surgical implements, and Jose Rizal was an eye doctor. But I don't think he carried around a fucking bone saw for that. I feel like a surgeon would understand why that was impractical for that activity. Yeah. More. You know I, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. I, honestly, it always felt to me like Jack the Ripper was not a surgeon, but a dude who was able to get surgical implements, which honestly, they were fucking cutting people open in the gutters. You know, it's like he probably just swiped some shit. I don't know. Or just bought it. <laughs> Yeah, they exactly. Didn't keep, they didn't keep yeah, the, true. You could have just bought it. They fucking print receipts back in the fucking day. Like, how are you going to track that, dude? He probably just went into a shop and was like, I need surgical implements. And they were like, are you a surgeon? And he was like, yes. Why are you returning this? There's blood on it. <laughs> like, yeah. That, like, it's... Also, I will say, Jack the Ripper was a terrible speller. Like, the fucking letters that he sent. Jose Rizal knew 22 languages. Or gotta were, catch this mastermind. <laughs> or were the misspellings just to throw off the authorities? Hmm? Oh my God. Again, real conspiracy theory. <laughs> Imagine, dude, like these people, like they live in such a fucking wild ass world. You know what I mean? Well, it's like the it's kind of like when um people believe in past lives, and it's like you're never just a farmer that was shoveling shit. You're Cleopatra, you're fucking Joan of Arc, you're you're fucking Constantine. You're never just the dude that, like, died of malaria at 12, you know? Like, and it, to, to these conspiracy theorist people, it's always like, well, no, Jack the Ripper had to be somebody important because I've never heard of Todd Stewart, the guy who, you know, is just a baker down on 8th Street. Like, it has to be somebody I know. You know, Jack the Ripper was, I don't know, he probably just, like, lived with his mom. Yeah, probably. Like, it sounds like incel behavior, cutting up a bunch of women and, like, having a terrible manifesto <laughs> with a bunch of misspellings. Yeah. Yeah, he was an incel. <laughs> like, <laughs> Boom, solved. Yeah. No one getting Andrew that. Tate did it. <laughs> okay, sound, yeah, no. Sounds like, uh, you know, Rizal was getting some, like, a, a pretty a pretty impressive amount of some, like, pretty high-class pussy. Yeah. That's not serial killer behavior. Yeah, honestly, why would he? Why would he bother? Like, that's really only in, like... I mean, I'm sure there's some exception there. But, like, also, that's, that's this, only in movies and shit. Like, this dude was pretty small. He was pretty, He was pretty like, gangly. You don't get I angry don't think... when you're doing that. <laughs> yeah, no, he's... No, not, that's good. You're not dragon bodies. <laughs> like... Also, it doesn't sound practical. Like, you have to pay for prostitutes. This dude was a penny pincher. There's no way. Yeah, there's no way. I guess way he's doing the man. GTA thing where you kill the prostitute afterwards and you get money, I guess, you know, but like you back. get it back. But yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> After you watch the car wobble. <laughs> just jerking off to PS2 it's Down in a basement just, watching <laughs> down in the basement watching someone's older brother take a cut prostitute into a car, watch it shake, and then <laughs> kill the prostitute for money. Oh, a millennial man. classic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh 
<laughs> oh, that was awkward. On their weird little hacked Xbox. Um, For me, it was a cousin that uh, that was really into that one um, Biggie, uh, Notorious B.I.G. fucking uh, album. But, like, there's some sort of, like, skit in the middle of it where he's, like, having, like, sex with somebody. There's no song. It's just him going, oh, oh, you know, and, like, coming. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm Biggie Smalls and, and I'm nothing. <laughs> and that was always the song that they played. And it was, like, that's how you start the album? Why? <laughs> like, what the fuck? Just to let you know that they're, like, they're they're big adult men. That's how it felt. Who it know was what, like who totally understand what sex is. Yeah, it was, like, dude, I'm, like, 10 years old. He's, like, 15. You know, it's, like, like all yeah, right, that's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, 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 super cool. Oh, he's having just as much sex as I am because I'm 15. <laughs> yeah, sure, dude. What the fuck ever? I'm just trying to get on the Neopets website. Just fucking click the link for okay, me. I really need to get to Neopets, please. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> fucking... Oh, God damn it, Biggie Smalls. Like, yes, Have yes, we've all been under our dads or uncle's beds and pulled to that out. this fucking pet. <laughs> God damn it. Anyway, back to facts. It was while Rizal was in Hong Kong that he started pondering on an old dilemma. Yeah, his family getting evicted in Colombo sucked, but they were far from the first people to have this happen to them. He noticed Filipinos getting pushed out of their land more and more, and all with little notice. If only there was a safe place that they were guaranteed to be free. Not in their own country, of course, you know. No, it's that's not the kind of reform he wants. It's when Rizal instead started planning a new wild concept. He was going to make his own fucking country. Now, if you don't know where Borneo is, it's in northern Indonesia, third largest island in the world, apparently. There's people there, but that doesn't seem to be stopping anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Green- Greenland and New Guinea are first and second, respectfully, and I guess Australia doesn't count. Uh, you see, Rizal saw how things were being handled in Hong Kong with the British ruling from afar and recognized it as the same sort of thing happening in the Philippines. But Rizal wanted the same thing that they had, representation and better treatment, commonwealth status, if you will. But he figured with a new nation for his people, they could even govern themselves. With him as ruler, of course. Now, I find this interesting. Borneo was under British control, right? But as much as the British North Borneo Company were shipping resources out of the area, they had next to no manpower on the entire island. So Rizal sent the British North Borneo Company a letter, stating that he would lease the land from them for the next 999 years, and the payments for the island would begin in three years' time. During those first three years... Filipino exiles could get their own economy going for outsiders and be able to pay the bill when the time came. The British North Borneo Company thought it was a fantastic fucking deal. They jumped on the offer, even offering to help construct new buildings on the island as part of their lease. But, since Filipinos were technically under Spanish rule, Jose Rizal did the legal thing, and he asked permission (laughs) from the Spanish government to move the recently displaced people in his hometown of Colomba to this new island where they could govern themselves, calling it New Colomba. The Spanish government was nice enough to send a consulate to meet with Rizal, making it very official-looking when they gave their answer. And I can't imagine the meeting lasted very long, as the consulate pretty much just listened to Rizal's entire pitch and said, New settlement, huh? Kind of sounds like a safe place for a bunch of Filipinos to plan an insurrection. So the deal was kaput. Just absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was nice of him to like, oh, I, I really, that was a very well thought out and nice presentation the last four hours that you've been doing this. And um, no, no. So <laughs> anyway, I feel like um, you won't get lunch. I honestly <laughs> you feel validate like parking. <laughs> that was more of a just like, you know what? I want him to fucking know about this. Yeah, no. <laughs> like, you know what? I'm just going to let... I feel like it was kind of like a little like, fuck you, huh? <laughs> Check us out. Like, I mean, honestly, I'm trying to think of like what would have happened had he not asked the Spanish government because eventually they were trying their best to keep tabs on this dude. And if they saw him going to fucking Borneo with a bunch of other Filipinos, I have no doubt that they could have probably at some point just came over and massacred everyone there. Like, just being like, yeah, we killed a bunch of insurrectionists, and now we're going to make up the rest of his life story about him. Uh, hated us, wanted to uh, overthrow the government. He was getting help from America, and um, very small peepee. Very small. 
the it's wild pee pee. The smallest pee pee I've ever seen. Small man, smaller pee pee. <laughs> For whatever reason, in 1882, Jose Rizal decided to return to Manila. A Spanish spy that had been watching him in Hong Kong telegrammed a message ahead of him to the governor general, which said, quote, the rat is in the trap. That's not a very good um, code. It's not very discreet. <laughs> yes. I wonder what that means. What could this possibly <laughs> Rizal knew he was My on... finest minds on it at once. <laughs> <laughs> Rizal knew he was on a government watch list for sure, but I don't think he realized just how big of a villain he'd become in his absence. It turns out he'd been declared an enemy of the state. And with the idea for New Columba in the gutter, it was clear to Rizal that the Spanish government would be buckling down on their treatment of his people forever. So he created a short-lived secret society called La Liga Filipina, or the Philippine League. The group itself was inspired by Gumberza, the three friars that were executed 10 years prior in 1872. The idea behind the Philippine League was that they would do more than just slap posters up around town and wait for the people to be inspired, like what the uh, propaganda movement was doing. Instead, they'd seek action, getting people more involved in elections and peaceful protests to help reform the government. The Philippine League was officially established on July 3rd, 1892. The League of Filipino Gentlemen. Yeah. No, I mean, honestly, kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. They were established on July 3rd, 1892. And Jose Rizal was arrested three days later on July 6, 1892. Now, we'll get back to Rizal here in a moment, but just so you understand what's going to be happening in the background of this story for the next few years, <clears throat> you remember what happened with Edward Abbey and the Earth First movement? He basically inspired a group called Earth First to be established, but then there were some people in their ranks that felt not enough was being done, so they split off and started the much more radical Earth Liberation Front. <laughs> and what? It's a great name. Yeah, it's just aggressive <laughs> as fuck. That's all I'm saying. Like <laughs> They were aggressive as fuck. <laughs> and while Earth First was stuck doing protests, the ELF were burning down houses. Uh, same sort of thing happened here, because even with Rizal gone, the rest of the Philippine League still remained, right? Even if they didn't have anything to actually do yet. So instead... Some of these members reformed under a new organization, calling themselves Katipunan. And while their organization would be slow moving in just a few years' time, they would be the ones to light the powder keg that gains the Philippines their independence. Now, as far as Rizal himself went, the government saw that he was doubling down on stirring shit up and wanted to get rid of him. The thing is, they knew he wasn't looking to actually set fires or anything. He was just trying to get people organized enough to, like, make legal social reform. He wanted people to get out and vote. He was the dude by Powell's with a clipboard, basically. So, they exiled him a thousand kilometers south to Manila, to the town of... Ooh, I always mispronounce this. Tapitan. I, it, sound, it looks like Capitan, but with a D instead of a C, so I want to call it Tapitan. I want to call it Dapitan, but I'm always told that that's incorrect. I, I'm trying to remember. Dapitan, maybe? I don't know. It doesn't Die matter. Dapitan. They figured if he was... Dapton. <laughs> Dapton. They figured if he was far enough from the city where he came from, Rizal couldn't possibly build his reputation back up from nothing. But instead, Rizal saw the people of Dapitan needed a school, a hospital, and a water supply system, so he helped build all of them. Also taught more effective techniques in farming, so their crops gave a higher yield. And remember, one of his many talents was as a sculptor. So he taught some kids in Dapitan how to sculpt, and they became so good at stonework that they branched out to lay better foundations in nearby towns. The Spaniards' plan for Jose Rizal to die quiet very quickly fell apart. (laughs) Also, nowadays, teaching English in the Philippines is extremely commonplace, but back then there wasn't a very big English-speaking population, but it was here in Tapitan, with the school that Rizal helped build, that he added a curriculum in English so that the students might make better business deals for their communities. That way, instead of just having to deal with the local Spaniards where they knew they were going to get a crappy deal, they'd be able to deal with the other countries that came into port directly. Because while the Philippines might be under Spanish rule, 
every part of the country is very much a port for places like England, America, and China, and they all have someone on their ships that speaks English. To top it all off, with the government sending Rizal to a backwards area like Dapitan, not throwing shade, by the way, that's what it was 150 years ago. What is it now, Jordan? Kind of a big area of commerce. It's not oh, bad. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't been, but I want to go. Anyway. They figured maybe Rizal would just build a hut to call home and just hopefully he'd die quietly in a shack. Instead, Rizal cured an eye problem for a local landowner. No, Rizal is a pussy getting an animal. He's not, <laughs> he's not fucking... That, that no, shack is like, being brought down <laughs> every night. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, Rizal cured an eye problem for a local landowner, and he immediately gave Rizal this huge plot of land. The official story is that the guy gave Rizal a lottery ticket where the land was the prize, and Rizal just happened to win. Maybe but just come let, the fuck on. Maybe just let him go. <laughs> just, just let him... Just let him... I mean, I mean, you're trying to like, I don't know what other islands did send them to Cuba, you know, like, like <laughs> send them somewhere else, send them somewhere <laughs> you like, you know, yeah. like, I yeah. guess like send them somewhere. If you're hoping that he's going to die quiet, go send them somewhere where there's like rampant malaria or something, which I guess the Philippines does have anyway. Send them to it's Portland, like, man. <laughs> he's going to die of an overdose. Like send him to Portland. He's just, you know. <laughs> now, the, the good work Rizal was doing in Dapitan and was soon heard by the government officials in Manila, who were a little annoyed, to say the least. But the Catholic Church saw everything he was doing for his community and asked if he would consider joining the church. I mean, sure, he wrote essays about how they were corrupt and everything and a bunch of rapists, but that was like two years ago. It's all water under the bridge. So a couple friars from the local parish, asked Jose Rizal if he'd consider joining them. And he sat them down and gave them a hell of a lecture. Literally took, like, all day as he just bitched at them. <laughs> and whenever Rizal talked about his own beliefs, it seems like he was okay, actually... Okay, it's been another hour and a half, you guys. Um, I'll see you back here in ten minutes. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, we're going to go out for a quick break. Um, I'm going to fix the slideshow a little bit. But, um, yeah, we're going to get to uh, the... Um, uh, what do you call it? The, this is uh, uh, this is now we are on. We've just done uh, how you sucked. We're gonna talk we're about on the why you suck. We're gonna <laughs> talk about the conquistadors and why that was bad. Uh, so yeah, well, I'll see you guys in about fifteen minutes. <laughs> Bathroom break, everyone. Yeah. Uh, it seems like when he was talking about his own beliefs, he was more of a deist than anything. Like he was very much a believer in God, but like he was not religious really to to a what you would call a religious extent, you know. And by the way. Rizal was still in touch with friends and family. He was able to give and receive letters, though censors would, of course, be reading everything. But you remember all those languages he could speak? Well, he had friends from around the world at this point. Austria, France, England, Hong Kong. And the censors were having a hell of a time finding a translator for every letter he sent. They always did. But it just meant that all the letters Rizal was sending and receiving, because he had nothing better to do. Dude, You're in fucking it, exile. Just, let, just stop. It just, just it caused just a pain let him in go. the ass for everyone that had to work his case. Well, but they don't want to. They're afraid that like he is like the martyr for their cause without being dead yet. They're just like, fuck it. Like if if we maybe he'll make a third novel and it'll call us bigger bastards. I don't know. My ego's bruised. I don't. <laughs> so all in all. While Jose Rizal was forced to live the remainder of his days in the middle of nowhere, he had quickly found his new dwellings to be just as good as home. And although he would arguably create no more disruptions for the Spanish government while he was there, his old friends from the Philippine League, now reformed as the much more active Katipunan, were going to once again put him specifically in the crosshairs. And there was nothing he could do about it. My sources today, Rizal Without the Overcoat by Ambethar Ocampo, Anvil Publishing, Inc., Expanded Edition, Second Printing, 2001, El Filibusterismo by Jose Rizal, translated by Charles Derbyshire, Gutenberg.org, 1912, the translation is from 1912, not uploaded to the website in 1912, and Wikipedia. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. At a certain point, it's like, He's trying to live quietly. Like, he's doing his best to just 
I don't know, make the best. Like, he, I don't really have like, anything bad to say about the guy except for, you know, hitting on 14 year olds. To be fair, they didn't get weird for until she was 16, Caleb. So, although he probably also slept with that 17 year old uh, French girl and. Yeah, you know, so he, so little, he was a Ted Nugent the, fan. The, the, what about that's, it? You know, not the big, that's not the big focus of this <laughs> this impressive dude. Like he got like, I mean, honestly, he, he so he was like exiled to a shitty little community, and he was like, if I have to stay here for the rest of my days, I want it to be less shitty. And people do that when they move into shitty houses. They're like, well, at least I can throw up some wallpaper. You know, that's what he was doing. He's just like thriving. He's doing his damnedest. And the Spanish government is just like, oh, that's bad. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, it's like, why? <laughs> just leave them alone. It's kind of like you said, just leave them alone. Just let him go. Just <laughs> he let him... honestly would have just, he would have died there and been happy. But what if you just very... let him cook? Yeah. Just let uh, him cook. Are you trying to throw out fucking Gen Z slang? No. 